I would like to call upon Professor Yoni Bellmecker. Sorry, you cannot hear me. Professor Yoni Bellmecker. He followed in the footsteps of Alexander uh, von Humboldt. And today, uh, he's one of the staff of the School of Zoology and the Natural uh, Museum in the Tel Aviv University. And he researches how um, um, marine life react to different changes like um, the temperature of water rising, fishing, and so forth. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for the invite. I've been in the university all day, and I miss the previous uh, talks. I hope that uh, this sort of works. I'm an ecologist, and you're asking, what am I doing here? Because, and I was invited because he talked about electric fields and what happened in South America, but I have to say that I knew of Humboldt, and Humboldt very much influenced ecology, and since I'm an ecologist, I have a lot to say about Humboldt and a lot that I learned from him, and maybe I can share a bit of that with you. Humboldt visited in South America. He was there five years, and just like Darwin spent many years in, in the islands, Humboldt as well spent his journey investigating, exploring, feeling the wildlife. He was Venezuela and Peru, Mexico, many other countries, and his insights then led throughout his led him throughout his research, particularly during his classification and analysis stage. And the main insights, ecologically speaking, there are five, I think. One has to do with the key species. That has to do with the impact of climate and soil on the, the, disper the dispersion of species, the, uh, uh, the uh, mountain species, the and uh, gradients of uh, various species along the equator, and finally the impact of humanity on ecosystems. And we'll talk about my insights as well from a similar visit that I had in South America after, the, after my army service, and we'll talk about very similar topics. I visited in South America when I was young, very uh, young, like, uh, and, and what was interesting is that it wasn't a, a backpacker kind of a hiker holiday, but rather I, I joined a real eco delegation. I was very ecological from a young age, science, a, a science nerd. I loved plant life and wildlife from very young age, and uh, and uh, I and I drew my inspiration from my parents' broad uh, knowledge. And then I wanted to join a real research study that was in South America. Uh, with an American delegation trying to understand the impact of humanity and human population on a uh, sweetwater fish in the rivers there. And I was there in Guyana for several months. It's uh, in South America, even though culturally it's part of the Caribbeans. And then I traveled a bit, but I want to share my impressions from that period of time. It wasn't a regular trip. It was more of a work trip, a wildlife trip, an exploration to understand the ecosystems there. So one term that I think is one of the first uh, were the uh, key species or seminal species that are a bit more important than others, let's say. And it's a bit uh, against, you know, a different view that all species and all uh, families of animals are just as important and equally so. And uh, no, not everybody is equally important. Some are more important than others. You don't even always know which. And Humboldt's insights are described after his uh, uh, visit to the Llanos, the Llanos, uh, the banks of the Llanos, an area that's completely plain. There's no trees. There's no uh, uh, the, uh, uh, it's marshy, but there's one big tree that's called Mauritius tree, the Mauritius palm, and it has very sort of rich fruit, 
that provide the basis for all of the ecosystem of the Yamos. And uh, you can see this in his notes. Now, my insight of these kind of species come from a different place, from uh, uh, the Humboldt uh, cave in Venezuela. It wasn't discovered by Humboldt. Actually, it was just named for him. And, and this is called the oil bird. Now, this is an oil bird because it has a very, it has a high level of oil in the sense that locals would kill the bird, put it on, uh, uh, you know, and use it as a beacon, as a flare. They would use it instead of oil uh, and they would burn the bird. It's a bit horrifying today, but that's what happened. And what's interesting in this place is these birds, first of all, they're unique, they're uh, very special. The only bird that uses echolocation you know, a bit like uh, dolphins to navigate a knife. So it produces clicks that echo, reverberate uh, uh, through the forest and in the caves and allow them to live very deep in caves, not as deeply maybe as bats, but they can navigate in the dark. At night, it leaves the cave, leaves to the rainforest and can fly 50 kilometers through palm trees and only eat the seeds of the very, very oily palm tree and that's why they have such a high oil content. And what's interesting about this is that this bird comes back to its cave. Sometimes it, 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 it takes a poo along the way, it defecates, it, it scatters seeds, and a lot of the seeds uh, are in this cave as well. And when you go to this cave, it's produced a rainforest of palm trees, all the same height, all very white, not green, because they don't have direct sunlight. And then they grow as much as they can and they die, meaning a cave that is a forest. And within these tiny miniature uh, palms, there's an entire ecosystem that live within these, these caves, live there the entire lives, live on the basis of whether it's crabs or rats or mice or insects or centipedes and so forth. They live off these palms, these cave palms, thanks to these birds, these oil birds. And that's only because of the bird thanks to ha that has created this entire ecosystem by defecating seeds within the cave. Now, because I mostly work in marine environments, I want to move to another area, the Sikan fish. These are, uh, uh, these are uh, uh, invasive species that came in from the Suez Canal into the Israeli Mediterranean area. They're nice fish. I mean, they're, 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 you can eat them even. What's interesting is that they're kind of they're, they're herbivores. They eat plants, and in the past, apparently, there used to be lots of marine sod plants, uh, uh, surface vegetation on the on the on the seabed. And when we come to Israel, we can see that these seabeds are gone. There's nothing on them anymore because the fish, this key species in this case, it's invasive. It has eaten it all. And we do all sorts of studies in our marine lab. We can see these sort of metals. These are enclosed habitats in the sea in which we're trying to understand how can we can stop the impact of this invasive species of fish and see how reducing their numbers will allow the uh, plantation on the sea bed to regrow and renew. This is the second insight of Humboldt that has to do with the impact of climate and soil on species. Now, Humboldt wasn't interested in systematics, meaning the classification or a, a, a subclassification of species. He wanted to look at things a, from a bird's eye view. It really talks about species dispersion and so forth. And I'm sure that you've heard today, you had an, uh, uh, you talked about temperature and, and, menture, uh, and moisture and humidity and height and all of the geological elements, but also there's this great map of vegetation and plants, various plant varieties that are relevant to specific ecosystems. There are tropical, subtropical, and so forth, different elevations, heights, closer and farther away from the equator. And we can see that the general climate has uh, also uh, not only impact, but also the local climate, the uh, ocean currents, things that uh, moderate various, uh, various uh, natural climate phenomena. And Humboldt, it sounds trivial to us today, maybe, but Humboldt was the first to discover this. And it's very clear in every place that I saw in South America, these local climates and, uh, uh, and uh, the tapui, 
uh, if you know if you saw the movie up the animation movie up you probably know it's so there they they the bottom part of this area in Venezuela is savanna but when you go to the higher elevations there are big rock sand rock that are some of the oldest the most ancient in the world more than a billion year olds and the it's so old that there's no nutrients anymore in the soil and in the rock I mean it's so old that it's been dra- drained of its natural nutrients it takes three days to hike up there and at the very top there's lots of vegetation but it's tiny it's very very small there's lots of water there's fresh air and sunlight but it, the man vegetation can't grow because of the lack of nutrients in the soil and the There's no nutrients. The rock is so old, so ancient. There's almost no, it's bare of nutrients. And the way that they survive, uh, not all of the vegetation, is that there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's a lot of predatory plants. And this is one of the clearest uh, signs to me how uh, soil and, veg- and uh, climate impact varieties of species and plants. Uh, And in order to uh, understand this, Humboldt's, well, Humboldt's insights stand till this day, but we, our computational abilities have improved tenfold. You can see the three-toed sloth, three-toed sloth, and we look at environmental factors, temperature, uh, temperature uh, precipitation, and so forth. And there's lots of different indexes and modalities for calculations of uh, the various areas. There's IA, uh, AI, sorry, modalities that would pinpoint where species can thrive and do thrive. Uh, for example, in the Mediterranean, you can see where a certain species exists within the Mediterranean. You can see the coloration on the graphs that tells you what's the probability of finding it in a certain area. And another color would mention diversity. In a hundred years, because of global climate, we can see that things migrate from place to place. If you like a warmer climate, you'll go into warmer areas, colder, you'll go into colder areas. So the dispersion and the location, the geographical location of places Land life and animal life in the world at the moment is migrating along with the climate change and all sorts of animals and plants uh, would uh, creep towards what's more preferable to them in terms of their natural habitat the third uh, Humboldt has to do uh, Humboldt insight has to do with connectivity and he saw that all of the species that are there are species at certain levels or elevations and what's interesting he that he also compared it between different zones these elevation indices and uh, he could see in different areas of the world to see the differences and similarities in terms of elevation alone this was very clear to me as well when I climbed the Andes uh, you start with this you know sort of this tropical rainforest and Then it begins to fog up and finally you go into an Prama area like in Venezuela where the trees are completely different. The vegetation is completely different at the higher altitudes. People think as rainforest as maybe as the, the most uh, you know uh, vulnerable to extinct, But actually, these areas at the higher elevations are the ones that are being destroyed. First of all, they're smaller than the rainforest, but they're also being deforested at a, fast, fast, at a much faster rate. So it's a very interesting area, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, lichen and a lot, lot of plant growth on the rocks itself. Now, my current research... has to do with again connectivity but not in species but actually not in terms of species at elevations but rather at sea elevation is also something that's relevant underwater and here we see the depth level habitat of various species and we can see that certain species prefer uh, 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 the red ones by the way are invasive species Now, for understanding phenomena and dispersion of species is the first thing we ask about, but the question is what's going to happen now with the changes on the planet? So we can see all sorts of potential forecasts. It could be that species that are getting warmer than the warmer the water is getting it's too hot for them in the shallows, and they'll go deeper, right? They'll go deeper and deeper into the cooler waters. Maybe they'll deal with the heat, they'll stay at the surface. There are certain others will actually go even higher. And maybe 
there'll, there'll be lesser dispersion, meaning in the depth of the water, it will have the same amount of fish. And in the higher uh, levels of water, in the shallower water, we won't have any fish at all. And actually, we can see how the conditions that are changing uh, through global uh, through global and climate change are also impacting things worldwide. This particular graph shows the depth of cl uh, categories of species up until 700, 800 meters underwater, uh, all the way up to 40 meters uh, shallow water. And then this dispersion is different, not only in terms of the varieties, the warm water and cold water fish, cold water fish and almost uh, uh, not uh, moved, but hot. Uh, we can see that many fish cannot deal with the shallow, hot waters of the Mediterranean. They're going deeper and deeper and deeper. Now, we can look not in terms of geography, but rather in terms of time, and we can see a great range of responses to the various uh, uh, modality, uh, forecasts that we showed earlier. Some fish will go up, some will go down. We can see some numbers will get smaller, some numbers will uh, increase and we can see the local varieties, the invasive varieties, but it doesn't matter what the response is, a large number of them will go down in their uh, quantities, meaning they'll become rarer and rarer. And the last thing I want to talk about is the first, the fourth, the gradients of uh, the diversity in species. Uh, it's called the diversity gradient, basically. This was another term coined by uh, Humboldt. Now, this is a very strong sort of model, very clear, also very intuitive because we are familiar with it, but we look at it, it's not very clear why this is the case. And this modality I, th I saw most clearly when uh, I was traveling in Tobago. It's a tropical area and we can see how different it is from other areas in the world. It's in the Caribbean and it's completely different from what I saw in the Red Sea or in the, Mid in the in Middle East. So it's completely different. And, it's, and in my PhD, I talked about these, uh, the, the dispersion of species, and we can see the richness, the diversity in the Red Sea, for example, and then in Tanzania, in, in Africa, and finally the biggest uh, uh, drop in diversity in Australia. And this disparity in the diversity of species across the globe is something that can tell us and give us a lot of information about responses. And not only the ones that are around the equator uh, going south and, and north, but also west and east, meaning the biggest uh, region that is the most rich in diversity is an area that's called the coral a triangle in Papua New Guinea, in the Philippine area, and the very edge of Australia, the one that's richest in diversity. And as we go south, we see a drop. We can see the latitude, the connection between the latitude and the smaller number of species. But there is also a simber drop in numbers and diversity numbers when we go west. So here we can see a drop in the number of species. And even though the Red Sea is very rich in, in, in wildlife, uh, and it, but in the but it, but it's uh, not it doesn't speak to the richness of this particular triangle specific area. I can talk about that a great deal, so I don't have a simple answer for you. I'll finish the lecture. I'll be happy to answer questions at the end if I have time. Okay, so there are two kinds of inform information that you gather either in-depth information on a smaller area or a broader sampling, smaller sampling from a broader number of sources. And this is how we, and very different, of course, statistical ways and approaches to triangulate information and create modalities and the calculations to create these kind of forecasts. So these are, this is data based on transactions, meaning surveys, including my lab, and it's connected to a lot of other studies and uh, what we have here is a model that's very similar from east west to north south and we believe that the reason is very uh, is simple and one of the things that i deal with is trying to understand what is creates these uh, uh, gradients and when a few years ago we also started examining how how a, a view in habitats in birds 
is change is different from tropical areas and other areas and when there's a specialization of species you can have more species cohabit the same area because each is a specialist so in the tropical area we have a lot of specialist species this is something that we see across south america and so forth where they can live more different more a greater number of different animals in the same area now there's no clear-cut answers in ecology but many studies are trying to understand what <coughs> creates and the creation and the, the connection between diversity and the rate of creation of uh, new species and the range of qualities or characteristics like for example if they're specialist animals or not and what we did in this study is we tried to see the direct and indirect correlations between these various factors to try to measure the gradients. The answer is a bit more complicated than what we wanted, than what we'd hoped. It's not just temperature or the size of the land or how many species cohabit, but rather a combination of all of those things and of several other factors as well. The last thing I want to talk about is the impact of man on the ecosystems. Humboldt was one of the first, actually, to, that, I mean, there's this concept that nature is huge, it's impossible to understand, and we, man, can barely touch it. We can barely change, you know, a single leaf on one of the trees. It doesn't matter how many fish we fish, we'll never deplete the seas. But as Humboldt traveled in Venezuela, uh, he saw that deforestation already in, uh, uh, in uh, so early in history, and we can see that through deforestation, there was an impact on the rivers, on the fertilizer, Fertilizers and the vegetation that uh, it was, and the pollution as well. And in terms of the microclimate, they were all disturbed. And Humboldt described this really, really articulately. And the question is, well, nature is great, nature is huge, but man can certainly create its impact and create bad impact, negative impact. This was obvious when I was in South America. We can see. Uh, uh, Guana, a huge country, suffering horrifically from deforestation that is killing the uh, uh, ecosystems there. And when I was, uh, and I saw, this is the Orinoco. I was on the Orinoco. I sailed it for many months. And we see the connection between Orinoco and the Enigmo area that uh, then in, with it, it spills into the delta of the, uh, of the Amazon. And we can see the marine light diversity, but it's full of fishermen. So there's so many fishermen there. Another big impact, of course, is gold mining. There are many gold quarries and uh, gold uh, sifting stations along the riverbeds. And uh, they sift the soil and they, they try to find, they, get a, they put in a bit of mercury in order to change. Yes, they use mercury residue. And of course, mercury is toxic it's cancerous and uh, oftentimes they use pumps and the pumps destroy the riverbanks because they mix in silt with the water so they don't preserve the banks the structure and 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 uh, a configuration of the banks and that means that lots of sand is being shifted from its the riverbed uh, mercury is introduced and of course marine life uh, dies heavy metals uh, pollution and so forth the damage is incalculable and today as well, I am trying to understand the impact of uh, humanity on ecosystems. And one of them is in marine uh, protected areas or reserves. And I'm trying to understand what is the impact of these reserves on their environment. This is a reserve and it could be there's lots of fish in the reserve. Uh, this was the number of fish. There's lots of fish outside. There are very few, that's clear. And it could be that there's lots of fish in the reserve, but also a lot of fish that sort of leak out because the, and the reserve is great because it's open. It allows fish to uh, you know, swim in and swim out. They learn the trick. They like to, they go fishing within the reserve where there are lots of nutrients and then they go swimming in the sea. And uh, they can see, and the fish come and uh, use the reserve basically as a, as a food source. Another thing that can happen is the borderline effect, meaning fish fish outside the reserve, but they impact the biomass of fish all within the reserve. So one of my students, Sela, is sure did the calculations on this, and what she found that there's a, a very strong diversity effect, uh, and it's greater than, and this is across the world, that uh, there's a lot of fish inside and very few fish outside, but the drop in the number of fish begins within the reserve. <laughs> 
meaning the reserves themselves are not reserved, they're not protected, and uh, uh, most of the marine pro uh, reserves are very, very small. This is the number of marine protected areas per cubic meter and their impact on their environment. Less than, there are very few reserves that are very, very large. Now, the smaller it is, the more impacted it is from its b the borderline effect because, <laughs> it, because the outskirts take up a lot more of its area. And within the reserve itself, the fish are not really protected in these kind of conditions. And we can see that in the smaller reserves, 55% of the fi there's 55% less biomass if there wasn't an outskirts uh, 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 impact. And thankfully, we can also impact this and we can reduce and mitigate this reduction by creating a buffer zone around these marine protected zones. So if we connect the story of global, uh, of, uh, global, uh, of global warming so uh, to see how these nature reserves would work after global climbing, we can see that it reduces the biomass of the fish inside. But what's the interaction? Can we create reserves that will really protect uh, the fish from global, uh, from uh, from uh, the biomass can deal with the heating of the water and reduce the the impact basically of man? And that's what we wanted to check, and that's what we mapped. And for that, we did samples throughout the Mediterranean. That was very very nice and fun, and we found something like this. If these are the temperatures and that's the biomass, per, uh, there's less that's heating up, as we know, from, and there's more biomass in areas that are protected rather than not protected, but there's no interaction between them. Meaning it seems that we are more geared towards this, where the reserves are not bigger, the climate change and the heating of the water does reduce the biomass, but the reserves won't be able, these protected zones won't be able to protect the, uh, uh, the fish uh, uh, in order and, and uh, to overset. So what we need is to deal with climate change, reduce fishing and fishery industry in order to balance it out. Okay, so if I summarize, there's no way other than saving nature going outside and just as Humboldt did understand that nature is beautiful and wondrous and we have to go outside and understand how it works uh, how it works and there's no replacement for we we have to maintain what we have uh, for us and for future generations I want to thank this, you know, road phrase that you all know, but you, you came late, so you didn't hear it. So I'll let you. Re I'll read it out to you, Professor Jonathan Ben Makir, my dear. I thank you for your contribution to this day, for sharing with us your profound and expansive knowledge that has enriched our knowledge and mine. I would like to give you a small token of my appreciation. The first two books of Cosmos. Out of the five written by Humboldt, it became a bestseller when it came out. And see this as a meager token in thanks and appreciation on behalf of myself and the Hulon Technology Institute.